Thank you, everybody. It's, uh, thanks for coming out. Great to see everybody. So this is going to be an interesting special event uh, at this year's conference. And uh, so uh, 10 years ago, the first time we had the conference here at Botanic Canyon, uh, we had a panel called The War of the Worldviews. And two of the panelists, I don't remember who the others were. Lodinov. Were, huh? Lodinov was one of them. Leonard Molinov. Leonard Molodinov and... Jeff Beck, was it? We don't remember. Anyway, it didn't matter because uh, at some point, uh, Sue and Deepak had a slight disagreement. And uh, I've never, ever before and since seen Deepak lose his cool, I'm, I must say. Uh, you didn't lose your cool, did you? Anyway. I lost uh, mine. So we're going to uh, uh, rekindle the uh, discussion on a, on a uh, collegial, uh, educational, uh, academic level, I hope. And uh, so um, Sue is going to start off by making an opening statement of, so of sorts, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, I hope you don't mind. I like walking up and down when I'm speaking. Uh, I've been completely thrown. I've been completely thrown by this evening, so it's going to be a wing it experience. Because first I thought we were going to do this, then we're going to do that, and then just now Deepak suggested we both just talk about our journey in life for 10 minutes. So, okay, I don't know how to do that, um, but I'll have a go. And I'll begin by saying what I was previously planning, which is I would like to point out some of the things that Deepak and I deeply agree about, because we disagree very fundamentally on some things, hence why we're here. But both of us have had a lifetime of meditation experience in very different realms. So Deepak, with his Indian background, has studied and practiced within Vedanta and yoga. And for me, it's been Zen. Um, I'm not a Buddhist. I won't sign up to beliefs and doctrines. Um, but I've been training in Zen for more than 40 years. And so along the way, both of us have had very, at least comparable experiences, deep spiritual, um, uh, mystical experiences, but also the steady grind of practice through which you get, um, you find these insights, which most people do find when they practice intensively for a long time. Insights into no self, or is it self, or self is not what you thought it was, hence my being an illusionist. Uh, into free will and agency, what is the agent? We imagine this agent as this inner being who's controlling the body, but that's a dualist view that really doesn't work. So where is the agency? I, I think there's no free will. It's a consequence of my practice as much as of my science. Um, but I think the thing that we most agree about before we end up disagreeing is non-duality. Both of us experience non-duality, perhaps uh, Deepak to a deeper, more persistent extent than me. I don't really know, and I don't know how one could really tell. But I have many experiences in which self and other are not different. They're the same. They become, the, the distinction falls away. The distinction between this and the inner and the outer, the distinction between mind and matter, hard problem, all of that, goes away. I can do this, I can do it now. Uh, it's in a nervous state talking to you, you wonderful lot. <laughs> it, it might be a bit, no, it's not, it's quite possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's quite possible. It's quite possible. But what I find then is it doesn't give me an intellectual understanding. It doesn't give me the way out of the hard problem. I can be it, experience it. It's, there's, there's oneness. But how is that? I don't know. So this is where it takes me into the unknown, into the mysterious, and on a very, um, it's a lovely place to be in because I know the practices to do, but I don't have an intellectual theory that kind of ex explains it. So that's where we, we part company. Now Deepak suggested I might have 10 minutes to say something about my journey, and he's going to do the same. I don't think of myself as having a journey exactly. I certainly don't think of myself as having a career because that's one of the things that right from the start kind of seemed impossible and never appealed. And I get irritated when people say, oh, you've had such a wonderful career. No, nah, I hate that word. Um, because people do have real careers. <laughs> and I've, I've kind of bumbled from 
discovery to discovery and take, I've been really, I'm grateful, really grateful that I live in a society where I'm allowed to do that. So those ideas began when I was studying physiology and psychology at Oxford, which is my scientific background that has continued. And I had a very dramatic out of the body experience, two and a half hours. I called it then astral projection. Um, that's all I knew. I don't think it's that now. But at the time, it convinced me. I, I mean, it went right through um, the tunnels, lights, the whole near death stuff into uh, experience of oneness and the total disintegration of self into the universe and so on. And a difficult journey of coming back that took some days in which I told myself, which is odd now, it makes such sense now, and then it didn't. I, t I can remember saying to myself over the next day, couple of days, you've got to go back inside the head and look out through the eyes, because I was simply out there. <laughs> so my life in a way, maybe this is a journey, Deepak, I don't know, has been trying to understand that experience and what that means. And over the years, as the neuroscience has developed, and the AI has developed, and the acceptance of um, um, mystical experiences and psychedelics and so on, which I've taken many of, um, all of that has developed. Now I can explain that. I mean, we know where in the um, right temporoparietal junction um, uh, out-of-body experiences are created. We know how it's to do with the, the, uh, the way the brain builds up a self-representation. Uh, the body schema, the body image, and all these things. We see how what's going on in the brain when you have those experiences, and that raises all these fascinating questions about well, what does that mean when you can understand the brain basis of something that transforms everything about yourself and the world. Um, how do you so, explain that basis? Pardon? How do you explain the basis of an out-of-body astral projection? Well, only to the... Only to the extent that a lot of my experiments showed that nothing leaves the body. I'll, I'll mention that a, a bit more, but um, we can see what's happening in the brain during these experiments, experiences, and we can provoke, well, we can't, some people can, surgeons, when they open up the brain. I'd like to hear about, your, about how you show that the, the consciousness doesn't leave the body. Oh, well, only, only a failure. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's an- How do you prove it, that? I can't, but can I finish and we maybe go can ahead. go on with that? So, so um, that experience led me to believe in telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, ghost, poltergeist. I spent 20 years as a parapsychologist, never finding any paranormal phenomena. And why? Because I'm a psi inhibitory experimenter. And if I go and spend the night in the most haunted pub in Britain, which I did things like that, um, I don't see the ghost. Other people do, that, you know, never mind. Uh, I never found any paranormal phenomena. I found a lot of other very interesting things. And I gave up the search for the kind of paranormal phenomena that would show that all of science has to be overthrown in a particular way, and instead took to uh, doing studies of the experiences themselves, all sorts of different experiences that I studied over the years. But I suppose when Deepak said to talk about my journey, then it would be that's part of the story is having to change my mind so very dramatically. Because I was, as a student, um, as a PhD student, I did my PhD in parapsychology, um, which was a rare thing to do. <laughs> I was one of the very first people who ever did that. Um, and um, it had become entirely who I was. Imagine me, um, aged 20, 25, whatever, um, with my hippie garb, reading tarot cards. I, have, I still have my crystal ball, gazing into my crystal ball. Um, that was, that was uh, you know, it was Sue the weirdo. It was Sue the, 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 the psychic obsessive. You know, that was who I was. And as the moment came when I uh, thought about all these different corners I could turn, well, if telepathy doesn't work in this way, maybe clairvoyance works in this way. Maybe, you know, there was always another, another corner you could turn until there came a point when there wasn't and I had to just completely change. Why I mention this is because scientifically that's the most important thing that can happen. It was a big deal in my time, but even in small deals, it's, it's the heart of science that when you, you have some great theory that you cling on to and the evidence suggests you're wrong, you change your mind. And the wonderful thing that I'm left with is I'm not afraid, to, well, I'm kind of afraid to change my mind, like, like I'm afraid to be uh, here and you know, it's ner nervous making. It would be, um, it's always difficult to have to change your mind and give up a pet theory. But 
that's the right thing to do in science. And when it comes to consciousness, I've had quite a few theories, and then they've all been demolished by various discoveries. And that's the exciting thing, and that's why I keep coming back to Tucson. I came here first in 1996. Um, and saw the, hair, the famous hairdryer, Dave Chalmers' hairdryer and all of that. And it's wonderful to be back here. So my journey ends up with me back here again. The meditation journey began because I was really struggling. Um, and I tried all these, pun? Yep. I was really struggling to um, make sense of everything. And the only thing that I stumbled across that helped was Zen meditation. And I took to very intensive training. I do two or three retreats a year. I do solitary retreats on my own in a little hut down by the sea. Um, I meditate every day. And as I said, that's led me to many of the same places as Deepak, but to a very different theoretical understanding. So let's hear from you, Deepak. Thank you. I'll, I'll be as succinct as possible. Pardon me? I'll be as uh, short as possible. Uh, Stuart said, make this an academic discussion. So we'll do that as well. But I do feel compelled to share with you my journey, as I told you as well. So my first existential crisis occurred when I was about six years old. My little brother was, at that time, about four. My parents were in England, and we were staying with our grandfather and uncles. And one day we got a telegram from England that my father had passed all his exams and he was now a member of the Royal College of Physicians. And to my grandfather, who was World War I uh, veteran, that was a big deal. And so he went to the roof of our apartment building, fired a few shots in celebration, took me and my brother, who, who is now the dean of education at Harvard Medical School, he took us uh, to a movie, I remember the movie, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, and uh, then a carnival, and then a beautiful dinner, and then in the middle of the night he died. And my memory was uh, listening to the wailing of uh, the women in the house and being carried off to a neighbor's place. The next day he was taken for cremation, and um, his ashes were brought in a jar, and uh, one of my uncles, said, so what's life? Yesterday he was celebrating, and today he's a bunch of ashes. And I felt terrorized, honestly, at six years of age. I, I wondered what life was. My little brother started losing, uh, his skin started peeling off. They took him to all the doctors. No one could make a diagnosis, till one healer said he's missing his parents and he's feeling vulnerable, and this is a metaphor, and when his parents come back, he'll be fine. And so it happened. So looking back, you know, this was an entry into what we call mind-body medicine for me, also of what is life all about. So I went to medical school, and you know, the first lesson in medical school is anatomy. You look at a dead body, you know, supposed to understand life. And that model never goes away. And then you have physiology, as you said, and suddenly you think, this thing that you thought was an anatomical structure actually has sentience. It has a response to sensations and feelings. It responds with motor activity. And so it becomes more interesting. And then there's biochemistry. It says all, all of this is chemicals. And you know, the interaction of chemicals and molecules does that, and then even in my training, there was biophysics. I said, oh, chemistry is physics. And uh, physics gets to uh, quantum mechanics, where we are suddenly now at the edge of the visible and the invisible, and then it becomes mathematics. And you know, all the theoretical physicists today are mathematicians to begin with, and then you say, why is mathematics so effective, and where is mathematics? You know, what about Gödel's theorem? And the Gödel's theorem uh, says there are theorems you can't prove, but they're true. So at this point, I kind of academically surrendered to this mystery of how the interaction of neural networks 
produces what consciousness is. And recently I've also befriended our friend uh, Don Hoffman, uh, who wrote the book uh, Case Against Reality, where he says that thinking that the brain produces consciousness is like you know, rubbing uh, Aladdin's lamp and the genie comes out and conjures, conjures up this world. Yes, we have neural networks to explain experience, but those neural correlates of experience don't tell you how you have the experience. Right now, as you're listening to me, uh, all that's going to your brain from your ears is an electrical current, electrical information. All that's happening in your brain is um, electrochemistry. But not only are you hearing sound, you're interpreting it, uh, you're agreeing or disagreeing, and uh, I don't see how the interaction of chemicals does that. How does that create thought and feeling and sensation and insight and intuition and intention and imagination and creativity and higher consciousness and transcendence? It just doesn't make sense to me. You know, it's, uh, and furthermore, consciousness is not a thing that you can observe. If you could, we would have seen it by now. But consciousness has no form. So having no form, you can only come to one conclusion. If it has no boundaries, it's invisible, and um, it's infinite. So where am I today? I believe that consciousness is fundamental, and space-time and gravity, and everything else, force fields, atoms, uh, quarks, bosons, are human names given to modes of knowing and experience in consciousness. In science, we create models of reality. We do not access reality. However hard I want to convince myself that there is something called matter, all I know is my perceptions. All I know is a species-specific perceptual activity happening in my consciousness. I call that matter. But nobody has proved the existence of a substance called matter just because we give names to Higgs boson. Higgs is an Irish guy and boson is a Bengali guy. And you know they observed something in the Hadron Collider under very special conditions. By the time they observed it, it wasn't even there. So in order to do these experiments, you have to ignore everything else that's going on reductionism, and you find one little alphabet in the language of life, and it explains all of life. So I do not think consciousness is in the brain. The brain is an experience in consciousness, and so are those uh, correlates. And consciousness is without cause, infinite, formless, irreducible, and fundamental, and prior to space-time and gravity and everything that we call the theater of space-time and causality. So that's where we disagree. Okay, great. Uh, Sue, <clears throat> do you think uh, the brain produces consciousness? They were clapping so loudly I couldn't hear your question. Do you think the brain produces consciousness? No, I do not think the brain produces consciousness. Um, I think uh, the way we think about consciousness is, is all wrong. That's why I call it an illusion. But people misunderstand that. They think I'm saying there's no Well, whether thing. it's an illusion or not, does, it, does the brain produce it? The idea that brain produces it is exactly the magic that um, Deepak has described. It, it doesn't make any sense that something mental is somehow exuded by this physical. So we have to take a different view. Now, I don't have a firm view on this, but one possibility is that what the brain is doing is is constructing a representation of a self. It's the models of self, it's the ideas that we have that brains construct because they're information processing systems, and they construct a false idea that inside here is a me that is having experiences. Wait, 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 a false idea of you, but that's not consciousness? What is it? That's 
That's consciousness. It's a false. It was but, that's but it's produced in the brain. Well, whatever you call it, it's produced in the brain. You call the it brain, sentience. The brain, to my mind, the brain is producing a false theory about things, which is why we've got the pro hard problem, which is why we're in such a muddle, which is why we're having such a great time here with so many different theories, well, because we can't, we can't uh, uh, understand this. I don't but understand how the, uh, y a false illusion that looks, acts, does everything else that we think consciousness does is not consciousness and not produced by the brain. So by Susan's logic, I'm speaking to an illusion right now. Yeah. You would and be speaking to... these are to two illusions having an argument. So hang on, hang on, hang on, Deepak. If, if that was... Hold it, hold it there for so one second. I believe that matter is the illusion. That there's no such thing as matter. Matter is the interpretation by human beings of a narrow band of perceptual activity, uh, which is a thin slice of electromagnetic, of the electromagnetic field. And there's more experience available to other species. We know we say, what does the world look like to a bat? Or an insect with a hundred eyes? Or a chameleon whose eyeballs swivel on two different I, axes? I agree with you You can't completely. even remotely imagine what this room would look like to another species or so, there is no such thing as a world. There's only world views. There are only world views, and there is no such thing as a world. It depends on who's looking, what's the instrument they're looking with, and what are the questions they're asking. And so then the next question is, who's asking the question? Who is asking this question? Are neural networks asking questions? Are neural networks arguing with each other at this moment? You've put us both down by that clever comment saying, oh, we're illusions talking to each other. That's you're, what you said, you're, consciousness. No, wait, 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 excuse me, excuse me, excuse no, me. Let, let me. No, let no, me. no, wait, wait. Deepak is saying that consciousness is primary and matter is an illu no, this is is illusion. Unfair, Stuart. I really, really want to answer a question that he You raised say consciousness is illusion and matter is real. Is that correct? I'm just establishing no, your positions. Please, Stuart, let me say this. Because I think it comes to the heart of what Deepak and I are about and why we disagree. You suggested that we were illusions talking to each other, by which you are saying we are both in the deluded state of imagining that in here is a self and out there is a world. You know that neither of us live in our life like that. We both have enough experience of meditation and of insight and of mystical experience to no longer think that. So we are two physical bodies. Now, this is where we disagree and come to your, qu your point, Stuart. I would say, yes, it's neural networks talking to each other because I think there is, I, I mean, is it matter? What do we call it? I, whatever it is in, in this question, the mystery of existence, whatever it is that exists, Science can describe and it comes up with neural networks that give internal models of who we are and we fall for them But the answer to what you were saying is we are two physical evolved human bodies talking to each other So I, that's I, again I where I disagree that. I don't agree that we have something called a physical body Right, that's and where if we you disagree. say I have a physical body, please tell me which one you started as a fertilized egg then you were a zygote, then you were an embryo, then you were a baby, then a toddler, then a teenager, then this, all the way to dusty death. The body is not a noun, it's a verb, and it's a human construct for shifting perceptual activity in human consciousness, and that perceptual activity is a modified form of consciousness. So there is no body, there's, there's only consciousness, and this is a perceptual activity and a changing perceptual activity. At, and in the same way, there's no world. There's no physical world. There's no body. Everything from the atom to force fields to gravity to the theater of space-time and causality to the Milky Way galaxy and the two trillion galaxies out there, we are told, two trillion, seven hundred sextillion stars. Planet Earth is a speck of dust in all the beaches of the, of, of the planet. The other day I went to the beach actually, tried to pick up a speck of dust. I couldn't hold it in my hand. On this planet is a species called Homo sapiens that named itself Homo sapiens, wise ones, out of extreme humility and has the hubris to figure out the nature of consciousness by looking at a brain. 
All right, you were doesn't talking, make sense. You're, no, but what doesn't make sense either? Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree with with that. And but, you said but, inside out of body experience, consciousness has no inside, no outside. Exactly why this is why the out of body experience is a product of the illusion that. I think the bigger the mystery belief. is the in body experience. How do you get a uh, in body experience without being in the body? Because your body is in consciousness. It's the other way around. Your so mind is in consciousness. For you, what you call the world is in consciousness. For you, everything is consciousness. And you say that it's a, a creative consciousness. And no, it it's uncreated. It's without cause. It's timeless. Only experience is created, and experience dies at the moment it's born. Uh, what happened to five minutes ago? It's gone. But what it, happened to these words? By the time you hear them, they don't exist. So we never experience reality. We experience the past and interpret it as reality. So why do we agree about? We each have a microphone and we're each speaking. We why do, share why the do same we agree about the, you, the uh, Milky Way and the how many We ever share many? the same obs why? observation deck. Why? If it is we not share the same observation deck and we've been brought up with the same concepts through language, through science, through culture, through history, and these concepts have been recycling. And just because they've been recycling doesn't mean they're true. But why does this infinite potentiality of the formless consciousness give rise to a particular world in which there is Tucson and this universe? There's no these... particular world. This is a human experience of what we call the world. But we can do science. Why can we do science and answer questions If like... we are living in a virtual reality or a simulation or some what people call a projection or a dreamscape, and these are fictional characters in the dreamscape, then our new technologies are only extending our range of experience in the virtual reality. And you know, just because science is successful at creating models of reality, it doesn't mean that science accesses reality. Science is a methodology, a particular methodology, with a particular protocol, and a particular method of examination, and the best that science can do is prove or, or predict the results of experiments. That doesn't mean science. All, you know, we call the science of consciousness, but all understanding of consciousness through science is inferential. And that's what she's talking about. It's inferential. This neural network, this correlate of experience, but the direct experience of consciousness can't be inferential. It has to be self-awareness, which is who or what is asking these questions. Who is surprised by existence? You know, the great Bengali poet Tagore said that I exist is a perpetual surprise. And if you're not surprised by your existence, then your humanity is not complete. And so to be in surprise of existence, to have that wonder, to have that bewilderment, and then settle into the mystery of existence is the best we can do. It's the best we can do because a finite mind cannot understand an infinite formless domain. We use symbols, even in mathematics, to describe infinity and we can't do mathematics without infinity. So infinity, whatever it is, is real and this is a finite experience. You know, the Buddha said, this lifetime of ours is transient as autumn clouds. To watch the birth and death of beings is like looking at the movements of a dance. A lifetime is like a flash of lightning in the sky rushing by like a torrent down a steep mountain. Now at my age, I look back, four years, five years, teenage, and I ask who or what is looking back? That which looks back or watches has never changed. This body has changed, this mind has changed, this persona has changed. The other day I went to Rockefeller Center. I hadn't skated for 30 years. I picked up a pair of skates and started to ice skate. <laughs> Where did that come from? Because every well, cell indeed. in this brain is different.
You talk so glibly about brains um, as, as though they exist. Well, I studied um, neuroscience. Well, exactly. And so you're saying that all of this neuroscience, all these things we can find out, are somehow... Cool. Um, they are just consciousness. Can you tell me how an electrochemical impulse produces this argument. I don't think it does produce it. Then where is this coming from? Where are these words coming from? The words are coming from, I would say, they're coming from all the things you've said, from neural networks and so on. You use the, the words are coming from neural networks. Yes, but they are. So yes. neural networks think. We make they sense. Question, they, they, do, doubt, they, they question, they doubt, they argue. Yes, they do. They do and they give the they produce these arguments. The neural networks can do that kind of thing. Can neuro but, neural networks feel? But, but I wanted to... to can take they you, feel? Be conscious? You, you. I, I keep saying I don't have a grand theory of consciousness. There was a great paper earlier, um, the first one in the artificial intelligence session here today, where, um, I'm sorry, I don't oh, yeah. remember the name of Yosha the man. Yosha uh, Yeah, was, yeah. Was, 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 was talking about... Um, Very Dennett-like. Uh, yes. Um, that, uh, Not my cup of tea, but a great talk. <laughs> he, he, descri he described how um, representations can be constructed by neural networks, by artificial systems of different kinds, and that it is the, the awareness that we have is, is the, from the representation. In other words, representations are conscious, not physical things. He said, let, let me just say this. He said, and I think this is really interesting, I've thought about this a lot, physical systems cannot give rise to consciousness. I, I agree with you there. But they can give rise to representations of, of self. And those can be, um, can be conscious. I, I, wait, wait, you I said that to him in there. way back that in was, uh, way back in 1986 at a parapsychology conference. I gave this thought, which has kept with me, but I've never published it since then. Which is, there is nothing it's like to be a bat. There is only something it's like to be the bat's representation of the bat, and that representation is. Oh, I'm flying over here. I can see that. I can eat that. It's, you know, and, and in a human, it's a much more complicated representation of a self who lives inside. So that idea that it is the representations or the stories that are the awareness, not the physical thing. The physical thing produces them. Now, this relates to what Deepak was saying about virtual reality. He said, we live in a virtual reality. But he's using this metaphor which comes from, you have a physical system that is making the virtual reality, and, that, and, and he's denying the existence of that physical system. And this is where I want to understand what he's saying. Why okay. his, his consciousness field gives rise to particular things that can do all this clever stuff, and we can study it with science. So I have a deep interest in AI. Uh, we do a lot of studies using AI to predict results of experiments, including biological experiments. I've created a digital version of myself called Digital Deepak. And uh, this, uh, was, uh, this was on one of the night shows. Digi digital Deepak was on the night show and also on CNN. And so Digital Deepak has read 93 of my books and can answer any question that pertains to any of those Brilliant. things Brilliant. in the I like books. That. So the CNN... You're up to 93 books now? I'm up to 95 now. So uh, I'm not counting. I'm up to five. <laughs> Who's counting? So uh, the CNN reporter asked Digital Deepak, what did you have for breakfast? And he said, I don't eat breakfast. I don't experience hunger. I don't have longings. I don't have aspirations. I don't uh, have the fear of death. I don't know what that means. I don't have sexual urges. I don't have an inner life. Consciousness is this inner life that is now expressing itself. And there's no digital representation of an inner life. So isn't that a zombie? Sue, is, is that a, did he just describe a zombie? Say that again? A zombie, a philosophical zombie, David Chalmers coined. Someone yeah, who looks yeah. and acts like us, I would has no say, inner life. I would say yes. And by the way, uh, Dave will be coming live, and the band that's playing is going to uh, perform the zombie blues, and we hope uh, Dave's going to uh, chime in. I think we are all sleepwalking zombies. Uh, he agrees with Dennett. We, till we wake up. You know, when the Buddha was dying, as some of you know, people asked him, are you a prophet? Are you a, 
uh, Messiah, are you God? And he said no to everything. And finally, uh, his last words were, I'm awake. I w woke up from my identity as a, he didn't use those words, as a biological robot. So right now, as you guys are listening to me, please try one thing. Just be aware of that which is listening. So that presence that you feel, if you do feel it, that's consciousness. It's not your mind, which might be saying, I wish I had gone to the bathroom before this lecture. <laughs> okay? There's something behind that, and that's irreducible. As Max Planck said, there's nothing behind consciousness. You can't get behind consciousness. And you know, these were the pioneers, Max Planck and you know, Schrodinger. I don't know how many of you read Schrodinger's book, What is Life? I mean, he predicted what happened later with genetics and everything else. And uh, I think because we can make successful models of reality based on our agreement of constructs and language, um, doesn't mean that we know the truth. We are exploring models of what we think the truth is. But we can't explore the truth through a methodology that's looking for that which is looking. You know, consciousness is that which is looking. So you can't look at that which is looking except through a reflection. And so the subject-object split in science is artificial. It begins with an artificial uh, subject-object split because subject and object of experience are a unified activity in the cosmos. You know, uh, David Chalmers, I thought the other day I heard a nice phrase. He said, we are all, uh, we are all uh, junction points or uh, terminals for consciousness knowing itself in the universe. What I find fascinating about discussing things with Deepak is he says so many things are that I agree with and I'm going, yeah, 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 absolutely. And yet his underlying theory is to me both untestable and unnecessary. He says that everything is, is, comes, uh, arises from this infinite potential of consciousness that is, has this creative ability to produce all of this and all these things that we talk about and, and the evolved nature of, the, of, of animals and, and plants and us and so on. But we don't, it, it doesn't help. We, we evolved, the creativity comes, I would say, from the um, evolutionary algorithm. When you have information that is copied with variation and selection, then you get evolution. You get amazing creativity. You get design for function, design out of that. That is a simple mathematical How process. How do you know that's all uh, random uh, uh, Darwinian evolution without any, anything it's, else? It's not random. I mean, you, you can well, produce the variation. Are random, Pardon? Suppose, mutations are supposedly Mutations random. are random. So it's very helpful to evolutionary systems, but not necessary, that the variation is generated randomly. Do you it think, just uh, makes it work better, but it I doesn't have to be. The critical thing is the selection. So when you have a lot of different things that are possible, little different animals, different plants, some get on better in the environment they're in than the others, the others die off, and these ones pass on whatever it was that helped them to, be, to succeed in that environment. This is where the creativity comes from. Now, if we didn't have that theory and we couldn't understand that, we might be looking for something like this conscious basis, which is infinite potential. But I don't think it helps. And this is why, even though I agree with so much that Deepak says, I go, yeah, but we don't need this, 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 this creative intelligence that comes out of nowhere and produces. Well, how did we get here? We got here by biological evolution and by natural processes. I, so, I have one question for Sue, just, Sue, if okay, I may. This is a serious question. Do you think that feelings play a role in evolution? Do I think what plays a role? Feelings, feelings. even like simple organisms getting to where we are. Did yeah, feelings yeah. do... Yeah, because feelings help them to negotiate the world they're in, to go towards things and away from other things. And our feelings so where, an algorithm. Pardon? Our feelings an algorithm. No, no, no. The feelings, are the, where the algorithm operates is, that, let's say you had a dozen uh, animals with different feelings and capacity for feeling. And in the particular... Well, wait, how did they get in, them? How did they get them? How did they get conscious feelings? Because previously, in the previous round of selection, ones that had a little bit of feeling got on better than the ones who didn't have any feeling at all. But where did and it so come from in the first place? It starts, well, it starts with, 
you know, I, I, I'm not an expert on the origins of life, but there are people who Well, are. we have a couple uh, we, in the room, but uh, it's a yeah, serious... probably here. I think so, Deepak would, would say that consciousness was here first. Sorry? He would, Deepak, I think, yeah. correct me if... Yeah, no, this is what I... First of all, I think I heard you say that creativity can be explained by algorithms. I think we create algorithms. Algorithms Indeed. didn't create us. And creativity is a disruption in the algorithm. It's Gödel's theorem, actually. It's a discontinuity, and you cannot program discontinuity in an algorithm. So, you know, I believe that consciousness has an element of creativity, uh, which is an expression of consciousness, not an algorithm. I also believe that feelings are more primordial than analytical thought. Every organism feels its way from the I agree. amoeba. And even, even biomolecules and their receptors, they feel each other. You know, there's one way to explain that, that there is only feeling. And the analysis, the intellectual understanding comes much later. See, I have three problems with the current scientific method. One is it's based on subject-object split. The second, which is artificial. Which could be the collapse of the wave function. Which could be the collapse of the wave function. I like that because the subject-object split actually creates what you call the Bing moment. Okay, so that could be the collapse of the wave function, except we don't know what the wave function is. You know? Well, well it's a mathematical calculation. No, it's more than that. But okay if you say so. So, subject-object split, number one. Number two, the assumption in science, predominantly, not always, that the world is physical, all the quantum mechanics is at the edge of the physical and the invisible. And number three, this assumption that the human finite brain can actually explain that which is infinite. We agree that infinity is needed to do even math. Okay, so everybody talks about infinity and zero in all of math without actually being able to conceptualize these concepts. We cannot conceptualize because as soon as we conceptualize, we create a boundary. Now, you know, many years ago when we were having these arguments and everybody was wanting to be one up on everybody else, which I'm beyond that now, um, I think. Um, but I asked a group of 100 physicists, is there one, one thing that you agree on? And they did. And that was every boundary is perceptual and conceptual and not real. So ultimate reality is boundless. Boundless in the atom. You go beyond the atom and the force fields and particles, boundless. Boundless in the cosmos. Boundless outward, boundless inward. Unimaginable, incomprehensible, don't even try, okay? Create models that work and extend this virtual reality. Science is a gift that humans came up with in consciousness. All theories are in consciousness. All experiments are designed in consciousness. All observations are in consciousness. And so do not deny the primacy of consciousness because once you do, you can rest at peace. When I look at the great spiritual traditions, not religious dogma, but religious experience, there are three things that stand out. One is transcendence. You find an identity which is beyond space and time. Space and time then becomes emergent, number one. Two, um, the emergence of platonic values like wonder, truth, uh, bewilderment, uh, comfort with ambiguity, uncertainty, uh, and also um, a desire for truth and goodness and beauty and love and compassion and joy and equanimity and the loss of the fear of death. So what is the advantage of understanding yourself as pure consciousness? Well, if you had transcendence, there's no birth death. That's also a false construct based on false identity. There is, there is ultimate peace and there's loss of the fear of death. 
I think we that's a pretty good price. We come back to this extraordinary fact that there's so much of what you say that I agree with, and yet fundamentally your theory, I, I want to ask you this. So as far as I can understand it, as far as you think, consciousness is primary. Matter does not exist. It's created by consciousness. Now, can you test this theory? And is there anything that, would ha that could happen, any data that would come about, or any experience you the would have only way that I would make you change your mind and reject your theory? The only way I can test it, Susan, is when I look for matter, all I find is my perceptions. And me too. And so then I yes, ask, where, look, do my, here are the where are my perceptions coming from? And yet I can do science. They are modifications of consciousness. All we experience, by the way, is qualia. All we experience is qualia. Yes. Then we construct perceptions and emotions and feelings and but theory. when you say it theories. is all consciousness you're not and qualia means quality of yes, consciousness but you're not doesn't the word anything. qualia mean quality of consciousness you cannot explain why there is this world rather than another world who it's says all that there is only this world well we can i mean agree. every We're species agreeing. has its own world yes you know, what's the dance of, have you ever seen, uh, you know, a honeybee comes from a grove, a honeybee comes from a grove, does something called a waggle dance, and all the other bees know exactly which grove to go to. What language is that? Is there what is that reality? Is there anything that could happen that would make you change your mind or develop your theory in a different way or have a different understanding? I have given up on the mind. The mind is the mistake of the intellect. Take it off and, and you know, go beyond the mind. The mind is what creates all the mistakes. To begin with, the idea that there's me and others when actually me is a bunch of sensations in consciousness, the other is another bunch of sensations in consciousness interpreted differently. Let, let me ask Sue a question. How would you test your theory? How would you test the, the notion that consciousness is an illusion? Who's doing the testing, first well, of all? Let, let her answer. I, I, the, the fact that it's an illusion is very clear from what we've talked about in, um, of our meditation experiences and Why? so on. It's not an if illusion we imagine, if we, uh, Hang on. The definition of an illusion, because I got confused about this. Look up in the dictionary. An illusion is something that it's not what it seems to be. Now, in, in many cases, perhaps all of us, we begin by, by being dualists. Young children are dualists very early on. They have an idea that this is my mind and I'm controlling Well, excuse my me, it's, it's, it's okay to say there are illusions in consciousness, but it's, it's, not for, it's not the same as saying that consciousness is an illusion. <laughs> are you saying that all I, of... I I love you, audience. You're wonderful. I'll try and be brief. Um, I only say that consciousness is an illusion when we live with the idea that I am inside, looking May out I through my eyes at the world. Yeah. Well, I'm not She's sticking up for you. Okay, Sue, you have the floor. Say that again. What did? Okay. Let her talk. No, no, no. We're not. We're not done. I don't I, even I, know what everyone's whooping about and what this lady just said. They're claiming we're not letting you speak enough. Oh. <laughs> well, I think I've speak quite enough because I want to ask questions of Deepak. And I would still like to ask, ask the same question. Would be anything that would change your mind? Because to me, the process of living, of going through life, of getting older, um, trying to understand, struggling with the mystery of existence, struggling with why is there sentience in the world at all, I keep having to change my mind because the science keeps changing. But for you, I want to know, is there anything that would change your mind about your theory of um, the underlying it's all consciousness theory. I, I think I said it. I don't believe the mind can solve any of the mystery of existence till we know what the source of the mind is. And the mind, the source of the mind is consciousness, knowing itself as that. And talking about illusions, my experience tells me that this Earth is stationary and I know it's spinning at dizzying speeds and hurtling through space at thousands of miles an hour. Uh, I know this ground seems flat, but it's not. You look three-dimensional solid in space-time, you're proportionately as void as intergalactic space. Everything you see, 
And this is where I'm coming from. If you can see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, think about it, imagine it, conceptualize it, it's an illusion. What is not an illusion is the awareness that is giving birth to the illusion. That's the only non-changing factor in every changing experience of the illusion. I think what bothers me here is that for you, this underlying consciousness which everything comes from has infinite potential and therefore there's no particular reason why it should take one form or another. When we do science, we can see that the world is this way and not that way. We're constantly asking questions. If we do this, what will happen? If we do that, what will happen? But if you say that everything comes from consciousness, it sort of stops any inquiry. You, you talk about mystery and both of us embrace mystery, embrace sitting in meditation and asking, who am I? What is this? Where is this? How can this be? We, we, we can embrace that, that mystery. Science can help us answer questions, but I don't understand at all Science? how your idea can help us answer who's, anything. Who's we who's yeah, asking these exactly. questions? Exactly. Who is, who do, who is doing science? Whole is the bodies. brain okay. trying to understand okay. the brain? Here's something that I think is really important that we tend to neglect. The difference between the self that I I often think I am, the illusory self, which is very helpful in life when we have to get on with it. This is a story about a me that lived through my life. It's a story, but you know, can't really find it when you go looking for it. So there's that self, which we falsely attribute free will and agency and so on, when it's the whole person, this thing here, that is speaking and doing. These words are coming out not because there's an inner me thinking them in advance and saying them, they're coming out because of this whole body and its past and all the things it's learned and the brain and everything I've learned here with all of you lot. Um, that, that's a helpful way of looking at it, I think, not just to say it somehow it's come out of this infinite possibility of consciousness. Well, you have asked uh, scientists, what's the universe made of? Um, I think the shortest answer is. And that, that's a, a real mystery, isn't it? What yeah. is it made of? What? To me, the structure. There has to be some structure, and I don't understand, in, in your view, Deepak, I didn't how finish this, why there is structure. Sorry, please, please well, finish. Well, well, finish. If you ask scientists, what's the universe made of, the shortest, most succinct answer is it's made of nothing. Whatever you call that quantum field, vacuum, whatever. Then, of course, the hard problem is if it's made of nothing, then why does it look like this? Okay, those are the two basic conundrums. Yep. Why does it look like this? And what I'm saying is consciousness modifies itself into a species-specific activity called perception, and then that cognition constructs the models of a physical world. And it's very useful to do science, but science is a methodology for looking at the results of experiments, not at understanding directly truth with a capital T. I think there are not very many scientists who would think they are getting at truth with a capital T. Good. I would think they are getting to a better, more workable understanding of the world and solving some mysteries and finding many more appear every time you solve one. I, I would like, if it's all right with you, to change the subject and ask you a different question. Thank you. Um, ask you a different question. Because we are here, uh, thanks to Abby. Thank you, Abby. Um, <laughs> thanks to Abby, who suggested that after 10 years, we, we, should, we should come back. Now, how many of you here were here in 2012? A few. How many of you have seen the thing on, online? A few more. Um, because we had quite an interesting confrontation. And it sort of went like this. Okay, imagine that he's me and I'm him, okay? Right, I'm Deepak. Now, I want to tell you that... Uh, in the study of Vedanta, there is an idea about how to live your life. This is you spend the first uh, 25 years of your life getting educated and learning and growing up. And the second 25 years of your life making money and making progress and um, create, creating things and so on. And the third um, uh, part of your back. life is you give back. And you said, I am very rich and I've got plenty to give back and I'm supporting lots of starving children and, and so on, and, and that's fine. And in the final uh, 25 years of your life, or the rest of the life, I suppose, um, you uh, give it all up and go away to seek transcendence or enlightenment. Now, back then in 2012, Deepak was 65 and I was 60. And now, 
He has just become 75. So I would like to ask you, Deepak, uh, you come to this final stage in your life. Um, what form is this well, going to take? Well, let's hope not what, what form is this going to take? Are you going to do the traditional version of, probably not, we're in a new world in the 21st century, of going up into the Himalayas and staying in a cave and having the village people bring you rice every week or something? Um, are you going to sit on the California coast in a beautiful place and contemplate? Uh, 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 what form is your withdrawal from the world and seeking enlightenment going to take? I think at this stage um, I surrender to the formless <laughs> and without that formless there is no form and I go back to my tradition Tagore he says in this playhouse of infinite forms I caught sight of the formless the formless is the only thing that's timeless forms come and go and if we surrender to that mystery of form, the formless, then that is what I call faith, not belief. Belief is a cover-up for insecurity. Faith is surrendering to the invisible that makes the visible possible. And when you understand that in that invisible, we're all entangled, then the ultimate message that comes from that is love. Love not as a sentiment, but love is the ultimate truth of the entanglement of every sentient being, every mode of knowing, every knower, and everything known. That's love. Very good. Very good. I think we come to love through these practices. It's taken me a long time. I <laughs> tend to be a slightly aggressive person, as you may not have noticed. Um, and and it, it is wonderful how these inquiries into who am I, what is all this, does lead to, to it changes the self to be less important and less grabby, and that leads to more easily to compassion. And, but it is possible to say those things you just said, difficult but possible, to carry on with a life of writing lots of books, earning lots of money, coming to lots of conferences, flying around the world, but it's, that's not the point of this four-stage process of, well, of in dharma, my tradition, karma, the four moksha. Goals, the four goals of life are karma, which means sensual delight, which comes through mindfulness, karma, not karma, karma, as in Kama Sutra, artha, making money, that's part of my spiritual tradition, dharma, finding purpose, and finally moksha, giving it all up, because you have no choice. <laughs> this is going to go. You have to give it up. You told me last night when we had a lovely conversation that you really feel at your age that you have changed, that you are ready for some kind of different life. But here you are in Tucson with an aeroplane from New York. It's something to do, right? <laughs> something to do. What did you say? Something to do. We, 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 we <laughs> fluctuate <laughs> between, what's that song? Dooby dooby doo. Okay, being and doing, being and doing, and but that's, that's the fluctuation of consciousness. But seeking enlightenment is also something to do. No, you, you fall into it, you don't seek it, because that which you're seeking is the one that's seeking. That's a good way to end it. I agree. Uh, Sue had the first word, Deepak gets the last word. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for being a little rowdy. I thought it was a great discussion. Uh, Everybody have a great evening, and the uh, conference starts up uh, tomorrow morning, 8.30, all day on Psychedelics. See you then.